Hello, and welcome to Implementing ABA at Home. Um, we're so grateful you guys are joining us today. Um, my name is Sarah Rintamaki. I'm the Executive Director of Connecting for Kids, and I'm so pleased to announce that tonight's program is provided by Nordson Corporation Foundation. And we are so grateful for the fact that they are still helping us to educate and support our families um, during this time of a crisis. And so this presentation was originally scheduled to happen um, in a public library, but instead we are so pleased that you're able to join us tonight on Facebook Live. Um, I also wanted to mention that tonight's program is co-sponsored by the Autism Society of Greater Cleveland. Um, ABA is a topic that um, has some proponents that are big um, proponents of it and some people who have not had great experiences with it. And so like with all therapies and um, ideas that you need to have with your child, we're recommending that it's always best to consult your pediatrician um, and the healthcare professionals before you begin any therapies. And so tonight what we're doing is we're providing some ideas about what ABA is in order for you as a family to be able to decide if this is something that would be beneficial for your child. So what I'm gonna do is we are so pleased to have two professionals from Silver Lining Group here tonight with us, and I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. Ken, why don't we begin with you? Hi, uh, my name is Ken Dix, and I've been working with the Silver Lining Group and uh, by default uh, with applied behavior analysis in children with autism since 2011. Uh, started out as a behavior technician and then have had a few different roles within the company. Wonderful, thank you, Ken. Yeah. And Alara. Hi, my name is Alara. I am currently the board certified behavior analyst for our Westlake location. I am also a certified Ohio behavior analyst as well as I am the supervisor for our outreach department. I have been working for this company for a little over four years now. I started off as a behavior technician and kind of worked my way through as I finished school. Wonderful, and thank you for both joining us. Andrea. Hi everybody, I am Andrea Campesino. I am a family resource specialist with Connecting for Kids. And tonight I'm going to be reading all of your questions and passing those along to the experts. Uh, so there's two ways you can post your question in the comments below, um, or if you rather do that privately anonymously, you can send me a text. So during the presentation, I'm gonna be checking my phone and I'll make sure we read your question. Um, you can find my number at the comments below as well, is the 440-907-9130. And if you register for this program, you should have received the slides via email. But if you're just joining us right now, um, you can find those in the first comment below as well. Okay. So the way the presentation is going to work tonight is we're going to go through a few of the prepared slides. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions. So if you have a question while this is going on, please feel free to post it in the comments or to text Andrea. But for now, what we'll do is I will move it on to the slides. So just give me a moment to share the screen. Awesome. So um, when we had initially talked to Connecting for Kids about having this presentation, we were going to do kind of a basics of ABA and like Sarah had said we were going to be doing it doing it I think in Elyria at a library out there in person and then uh, everything happened in the world that happened uh, with the stay-at-home order and the coronavirus and things so um, we all decided that it would be worth our while still to take it online and to try and maybe change the scope of it a little bit and focus more on how we can help out uh, parents right now um, in the home with, uh, you know, the different issues that you might be facing. Um, and then can you go to the next slide, please? All right, and so real quick, before we dive into anything, it's important for us to uh, make abundantly clear to everyone that it's important to note that applied behavior analysis is a broad subject that cannot thoroughly be taught in a brief presentation. Our intent is to discuss some basic concepts and interventions, with, interventions within that broad subject matter that will hopefully provide the audience with additional information during this time of need. Um, all intent attendees are encouraged to seek out behavior analysts or organizations that can conduct thorough assessments and provide individualized treatment options for those who may benefit. 
And so obviously we are the silver lining group. We have a center-based program that is currently not uh, providing services, but we also do have an outreach program typically that involves going into the home. Um, obviously again though, with the stay at home order and everyone's concerns about safety, we haven't been doing that, but we have been providing uh, telehealth ther ther uh, therapy as we can. You know, it's not appropriate for everyone. We know that it's a busy time for all the parents, stressful time for, you know, all of the kiddos, um, but we're doing what we can with that. So we are a provider that can assist with that. Um, I know that there are other providers in the area. I'm sure Connecting for Kids can provide you with those resources, other ABA providers in the area, um, as well as probably like a Milestones organization uh, could probably be another resource that could put you in contact with the different ABA providers in the area. Um, so again, we just want to kind of overemphasize that point and we're probably gonna be bringing, up, bringing it up a lot more during this presentation. Um, what we're going to be doing is trying to answer some questions, but how deeply we're able to go into those questions, um, you know, might be difficult to determine until we know what they are, but you're definitely encouraged to seek out a provider if you don't have one. And if you do already have one, um, you know what I mean, to reach out to them and, you know, see what they're able to provide you uh, during this difficult time. Um, so a few different uh, topics and components that we would typically go over uh, fairly early on when we're talking about parent training or talking about training staff here that work with our kiddos and implement ABA uh, with individuals. Um, the three-term contingency, which is antecedent behavior consequence, reinforcement, which essentially, if you want to talk in layman's terms, is motivation. Functions of behavior, which we'll go over, I don't want to say in detail, but in a lot more detail than the other components. And then probably by default, some antecedent interventions and consequence interventions. And antecedent interventions are manipulations that are made before problem behavior occurs. And consequence interventions essentially are what you do after that problem behavior uh, occurs. Cool. And then, Alaria, you want to jump in and do these next few? Uh, yes. Thank you, Ken. So the first thing that, again, we're going to be talking about is functions of behavior. Because I know typically right now parents are kind of just like, my kid's doing this, or I don't know what's happening. That's, the, that's what our functions are. Our functions are going to tell us why is this happening. And it gives us the little help that uh, you may need to kind of help ease the situation. So to go with the slides that is presented, uh, behavior is anything that a person or, orga or organism does. Much of the time we are concerned with observable, measurable behavior when working within the framework of applied behavior analysis. So that just means if I see it, I need to make sure that I can record it somehow. I I'm gonna remember that it's happening so then I can recall it and then kind of break it apart and see what fix it. Um, when looking from, from the behavior analytic perspective, no behavior exists that does not have a purpose. We always have a purpose for what we do. We go to work because we're gonna get paid. There's always gonna be a purpose. Um, there's many varying levels of importance, but few, if any, happen for no reason at all. I don't eat just to eat sometimes. There's typically because I'm hungry. Um, when um, we talk about the function of a behavior, we are talking about the purpose of that behavior. So we're, again, really highlighting that is why is this happening? Like, what is the reason in which this child is engaging in these behaviors? Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so for this training, we're gonna break down behaviors into four categories of function. So that's access access to a tangible reinforcement. So this basically means at home, it can be an iPad, um, it can be computer time, um, it can be a specific toy, um, that's what they want. They want access to that. Um, attention, um, definition, access, uh, access to socially mediated reinforcement. This basically means if I'm sitting there, they want my attention. They want some sort of attention somehow, some way. Um, escape. We either escape or avoidance. Um, math, who likes math? So they're trying to escape from trying to do that math. Um, automatic reinforcement appears to be internally provided. A lot of this time when you see that, that means you doesn't need anything. I am happy within myself 
and I don't need anybody else. It's just me, myself, and I. Um, so those are little generic, broken down um, categories, but we'll definitely give more um, examples on our next slide. Okay, so for our first one is access. Think wanting something, example, a child crying because they wanted more time with that video game. So when you, when they want something, they're really gonna be motivated in order to be able to get access to that item. Here's a real, real world amp that you might be dealing with while you're at home. Client requesting the, the use of his iPad, right? Then you said, nope, you can only get your iPad after we have dinner. And then your, maybe your child starts to cry. So that, that function of what you're seeing, that behavior that happened was because of that access to that iPad. Um, the next one we have is attention. Think social interactions, pleasant and even not so pleasant. Um, the example for this one, a child repeatedly saying your name and asking you to look at them. How many times have we seen something that says mom, 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 or the viral video of Linda, 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 Linda. <laughs> You're, they're automatically going to get that attention. Um, real world example, I can honestly say is having a kid sitting at the table, parents are cooking dinner, not paying them any attention. Went, got some water and decided to take it and dump it in the middle of the living room. That's clearly attention seeking. You weren't due to what you were doing, which is perfectly fine, but they didn't know how to possibly functionally communicate that they wanted your attention during that period. Our next one is escape and avoidance. Think removal of demand or expectation. Example given here is a child closing their mouth tightly to avoid broccoli. Clearly, they didn't want broccoli. Another example of escape is say, you, you know, with a lot of schools now, they are giving us um, homework for our kids to complete. And say, you bring that homework out and they see that. They're just like, oh no. And they can, they're just, they just run and they go straight to their room and they hide under their bed. They're escaping from having to do that homework because they saw you bringing it out. You didn't even have to say anything. It could have been for five minutes, 10 minutes down the road, but they saw that and they're trying to escape from being able to have to do it. The last one is automatic. Think something internal. Common examples for children with autism include verbal and motor stereotypy, also known as stimming, or ritualistic and repetitive behaviors with no obvious purpose to others. Common examples on a regular basis include humming, shaking leg, scratching an itch. Um, a lot of the times um, what we see here in a, our facility is you might see a lot of hand flapping. Um, you might see little hands going, things of that nature. It's automatic. It doesn't require anything from us. They're going to do it whether we're there or we're not there. So it, that's it's a little harder one to try to to gauge, I was like, but just always remember that it's either you're there and you're not there. The behavior happens regardless if you present that homework or you don't present that homework. If you present that iPad or you don't present that iPad, that behavior will be continuous. Uh, next slide. So how can this help me at home? Correctly identifying the function of a behavior can help determine how you should respond to it. This is important because some interventions can apply to multiple functions, but sometimes an intervention that addresses one behavior and its function appropriately can be the exact wrong intervention for another behavior and its function. This is basically meaning, so say that you have a child that is doing something to escape and you think it's for attention. So you're gonna give, let them get out of doing that homework because you think they just wanna come and hug on you and give you kisses because they just love you so much, which could be very true. I was like, but in actuality, they're just trying to do whatever they need to do to get out of that homework. So it's important to when you determine that function to make sure you're using the appropriate thing so you don't reinforce, reinforce me here, Reinforcement basically means in the, the likelihood of it happening again. 
So if all the time that I pres that homework comes out and I that child runs to you to give you hugs and it works, oh, they're betch every single time you do homework. It might translate to reading. It might translate to having to make their bed. It can translate completely. So it's really important that when you determine what's happening, that you use the appropriate intervention. Um, considerations before proceeding, rule out other possibilities before jumping um, to conclusions. Is there a medical reason outside of the diagnosis of a developmental disability that may be causing this behavior? This basically just means that before me as a behavior analyst or as your behavior analyst, we're going to make sure that the reasons that this is happening is because it's behavioral. It's not because maybe there's some sort of deficiency somewhere or, you know, that a medical professional is able to help. So, you know, we can't just assume that the reason they're not going to bed is just because they want to escape from bed. We need to make sure that there's nothing actually going on that hinders that ability for that child to go to bed. So it's going to be very important that before we just jump to a conclusion that we roll out certain um, medical conditions possibly or anything else that your um, pediatrician or any other professional that you're working with um, can roll in. Awesome. And then just to kind of like... Uh you know, piggyback on some of the things that Lara was saying. Um, so, you know, again, we've given like nine disclaimers at this point, and that's probably going to be a little bit of a theme uh, to what we're going to be doing. But what we'll try to be doing is, you know, like I said, we kind of shifted gears from what we initially were going to be doing as far as like an ABA 101 type of a thing goes, and we switched it over to uh, how can this help people now? Uh, because that's what we have been hearing from a lot of families uh, is that they are struggling. You know, families with children with special needs, families with children who do not have special needs um, are struggling because the schools are no longer functioning. Parents are getting homework home. Uh, they don't know what to do. They're trying to work from home as well as trying to, you know, provide their child with an education. And we know how stressful that's been and how taxing that's been. And so what we would like to do today is, you know, take different questions and just try to provide um, possibly like just input, uh, advice, draw on our own experience with different things that we have seen uh, based and, you know, try to answer questions that you may have, you know, structurally about ABA, different things like that. If they're very specific to your child, we'll do our best to give, um, you know what I mean, feedback to it. Um, but, you know, any questions that you have, feel free to you know, start sending them in and, um, you know, asking those different things. And uh, I know that Lauren, um, who was kind of like a, a big facilitator for us with Connecting for Kids and getting this set up, uh, had said she's going to post a resource page. Um, Sarah, do you know, is that on your website or is that going to be through your Facebook page? Yes. And so um, the, the resources that you provided, um, we will be um, emailing out to everybody who registered and then it will be on the, the comment section um, when um, we post this. We'll be posting this to our website as a podcast as well as a YouTube that people can. Um, but I do think we already have some questions. So why don't we go ahead and get started with those questions? Okay, great. So we have one question. It says, I am wondering if there is advice regarding ABA for kiddos who do not have autism. Um, my kiddo has other diagnoses. We want in-home medical team um, recommendations, but we only know of companies who service kids with autism for ABA. And insurance say they only cover for ASD. Thank you. Okay, so I would say... <laughs> um, mm -hmm. With that question, you know, this applied behavior analysis is not set up for kids with autism at all. You know, it, it has been found that uh, it is effective in reducing symptoms of autism. It's one of the only evidence-based therapies that has been proven to um, relieve symptoms of autism, but behavior analysis in and of itself isn't set up for autism. It's set up to describe behavior in general. You know, like what we'll try to do a lot of times, at least when I do like uh, staff or parent trainings, is yes, we give examples and we work primarily with children with autism, but we don't work exclusively with autism. 
I use examples for, you know, how behavior relates in day to day and, you know, the different behaviors that we all engage in can be explained through terms of, you know, behavior analysis in general. Um, you know, as far as the applied part goes, yes, that has been found to be effective with children with autism. But another thing too, and Alara, you might want to jump in too, because we were just talking about this a little bit uh, before the presentation is many of the kiddos, I know some people don't like that term, many of the children that we're working with um, have more than one diagnosis. You know, so where does the autism start and the obsessive compulsive disorder begin or where does the autism start and, you know, the oppositional defiant begin. So we do have kiddos uh, that, you know, have multiple diagnoses uh, and we have found, you know, I'm only going to speak from my experience at this point. Um, we have found it to be effective for, um, you know, a variety of kids with a variety of uh, diagnoses. But Larry, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that, like what we were talking about earlier with the dual diagnosis? Oh, definitely. So when it comes to dual diagnosis, yes, a lot of our uh, children that we do have, autism may be the primary diagnosis, but you are, there's children with ADHD. Currently at this facility, a primary diagnosis of some of the kids that we may have is ADHD, it's um, PTSD. Um, so these diagnoses can definitely differ. But at the end of the day, um, we shouldn't get gung-ho on the diagnosis itself, but look at what, how exactly the ch how the child's behaving. I was like, you know, because putting a label on something doesn't, doesn't help the situation. So what we want to do is whether a child has ADHD or autism, if he wants that iPad, they're going to react to the way it's in order to get that iPad, whether it's autism or it's ADHD. Um, so let's try not to um, get, you know, big thing on, well, this is the diagnosis, so I have to go to ABA. ABA is a scientific um research that has been done in the way that it is presented, not specifically for autism, you know, autism is completely for um, ABA. I have done this unbeknownst to myself with those maybe around me that have children um, that, you know, you can ask or things of that nature, but it's like, and that's a typical child and they respond to that because guess what, those motivators are still there regardless to what your diagnosis may be. I was like, so we should really, it's really it needs to be individualized. So whatever your diagnosis is, it's getting to know your child and how your child works and then modifying it the best that you can to be able to help in your household. So if you're noticing that iPod, that iPad might matter a lot, like utilize that regardless to what their diagnosis. They don't wanna sit down, use it. They don't wanna use the bathroom, use it reinforce those behaviors. I was like, but let's not stay, you know, that's just my personal one and only behavior analyst over here, but that's just my personal opinion. You know, our diagnosis gives us characteristics. I was like, but that does not give us who that person is. Right. So you see that things might be a little different, that's fine. I was like, but that doesn't mean we're cutting in this little cookie box be in order to help them. And so what I often tell families, and would you agree with just this question, is that uh, insurance will not cover it. However, they could private pay. Uh, so, so it is an option that if you think that this kind of therapy could help your child, you can still reach out to the centers, um, but you wouldn't be able to bill insurance, but you can actually come up with a payment plan and, and pay for the therapy yourself. Yeah, and that's definitely an option, you know, through most providers, depending how the provider's set up, you know, if they take private mm -hmm. pay, um, you would probably most likely have that issue with private insurance, mm -hmm. uh, different forms of Medicaid, it seems like it's easier to get coverage, although, you know, knock on wood whenever you say something <laughs> like that uh, with insurance, but yeah, it, on the second part of her question, first part of the question is, we think ABA is for everyone. Um, you know, but the second, <laughs> the second part of the question is, but who's going to pay for it? Uh, that's the harder question to answer always. Uh, and it is usually pretty expensive uh, to pay out of pocket for it with no assistance. But, um, you know, uh, as far as, you know, getting ABA for a child who does not have a diagnosis of autism through private insurance, that might be difficult. But I wouldn't necessarily say give up. You know, I would continue to 
um, seek things out, try different things. I mean, there is different types of, uh, you know, therapy and treatment out there. And, you know, I don't want to like go doom and gloom right away. If you've been trying those other types of therapy and you're not seeing any improvement, I don't see how that would hurt your case to then continue to go back and be like, well, this is what we think might be effective. We've tried these other things, you know, and they're not, um, you know, we're not getting results that we would like to see or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, you know, to continue to push for it, I don't know if that would work with private insurance, but I mean, that would be, it's a, a way that you have to go with other, in other areas, you know, prove that this doesn't work before you can get to the thing that does sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. And I definitely would recommend maybe ABA because, you know, typically um, you're going to a medical doctor. Yeah. And they, they don't know all the facets and all the different type of therapies that are out there. So say you've gone, you've done X, Y, and then you bring it up to them. Okay, I've done X, Y. I was like, can I try Z? And they're the ones that are going to be able to put on those records to state yes my child, they agree that they might benefit from this type of therapy instead of the other ones. So definitely talk to your providers, let them know, here's what I've been trying to get resources like connecting for kids and it just get out there. And it's, it, it might take a minute. It really does. It's not like a one fix it all and go to one doctor and they're instantly going to say ABA. They're not. That's just the reality. Cause if it's not the diagnosis of autism, they don't do that. But again, for what I'm definitely trying to urge out there and put out there, it doesn't, it does, ABA isn't just for autism. It helps every kid when you're, when everyone. We do have another question from a family. Any suggestions for gross motor activities since we are so confined in house? Okay, yeah. Um... You know, there's uh, all sorts of different things that, you know, we can try and do because at our center-based program, we, we, you know, we have some, uh, some space, but we don't have like a big uh, fenced-in playground for our kids to, you know, play in. So our staff get creative sometimes, um, you know, with the different activities that kids can do and uh, work on. Um, but, you know, we've had kids do yoga, um, make it into a game kind of like a Simon says or follow the leader type thing. You know, I know different, um, you know, house sizes or if you're in an apartment, there's not a ton of room um, to move around, but you know, that's the, the fun way or a way that we're able to get a lot of kids to buy in is to try and make things into a game, especially our, you know, elementary age kiddos and things like that. So you know, if we're working on gross motor skills here, you know, whether it be nonverbal imitation skills or receptive commands, things like that. And so nonverbal imitation would be, you know, I say, do this, and I, you know, hop once or something like that. And then I'd be expecting the child to hop once too. You know, we could do that 10 times in a row and the child might find that incredibly fun. Uh, but some kiddos want a little bit more purpose or more function than that. Um, so, you know, to try and turn it into a game, like, like I said, follow leader, I wouldn't necessarily do Simon says, because like the whole part of that one is if Simon doesn't say don't do it, and if you want the kid to do it, then make sure that they are uh, you're asking them to do it uh, in the correct context, especially if it's a kiddo, um, you know, who has any issues with, uh, you know, following commands or receptive communication, you don't want to play a trick on them or something like that, but try and turn things into a game. I mean, those are gross motor movements. Um, you know, I know that some of the parks are open for walks, you know, I'm sure that if they're asking this question, they've probably done a thousand of those already. Um, but, uh, you know, to just get up and get moving and try and make things into a game. There's a lot of different resources on, you know, Facebook and, you know, elsewhere online that, you know, people are coming up with super creative things. One Facebook group is ABA Skillshare. It's primarily professionals, but families do also get in there and the stuff that they're posting, it's not all gross motor, it's a variety of different things. Uh, they, you know, are posting different creative ways to, um, you know, uh, get kids up and moving and engaged in different tasks that you might not normally think of, think outside the box. Uh, different things we've done too is like, uh, you know, you have like a twister type game or like colored spots on the ground, you know, now everyone hop to the yellow spot or, you know, put your hand on the red one, things like that to get them moving, you know, also working on those 
you know, receptive labels and things like that. Um, you know, that's what's coming to mind right now uh, for that specifically. Hopefully that addresses their question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. We do right. have, uh, well, two more questions from a, uh, another family. So they are interested in hearing how ABA works and how ABA would be used to encourage participation in activities. Okay. Um, so as far as how ABA works, uh, that is very, you know, very broad question. There's a lot of different methodologies and teaching within behavior analysis and, you know, without going down like a, a list of, you know, different ways of teaching and acronyms that, you know, would take a while to explain. There's discrete trial training, which is like very regimented, very repetitive type of teaching. There's natural, which probably wouldn't get a lot of uh, buy-in or encouragement if you're having a, a child who doesn't want to like participate with things. Well, I don't want to say that completely, but it's probably not the best one. If you're talking natural environment training, that's trying to like embed teaching skills within what's already going on. There's like, um, what is it? The Denver model, Lara? Um, uh, it's got another name too. I can't think of it right now. But there's a, like a variety of different teaching methods within ABA that can teach skills. Uh, a lot of things that are happening in, you know, the public schools is they're trying to, um, I think mainstreaming is kind of the buzzword that's been used a lot, you know, using ABA techniques within the general education classroom. Um, you know, principles of reinforcement is probably your number one uh, like the crux of ABA, it's really the main tool that we have is getting to get that buy-in, to get them motivated in order to obtain something they like, to get us to be someone that they want to engage with by us, you know, giving them the things that they want to do, engaging with them the way that they want to. So there's a lot of rapport building involved. And then um, as far as getting the buy-in, I'm going to go again, like without going into like this is a training in and of itself that we give our staff members. Uh, it's a, a technique, a methodology called pairing. So you wanna pair yourself with the things that a child likes. When we first start working, like if we get a brand new kid that comes to the Silver Lining Group, um, you know, we want to make staff and make the Silver Lining Group as fun as we can possibly make it. We want to make that individual as comfortable as they can possibly be so that this is a place that they want to be. Uh, we like try to engage with them in the ways that they're trying to engage in their world and build up a rapport with them and make them know that we have things that they like that we can give to them as well as we can be fun and we can be people who um, can engage with them. But pairing is probably like the, the technique that I would say as far as getting a buy-in goes as well as pairing that with reinforcement. Um, and that process can go very quickly with some kids. And that process can take a lot longer to build up, especially depending on, um, you know, the severity of the disability, reinforcement history. You know, sometimes we're working with children who have been in several different placements before and they didn't go very well, which is why they're, you know, working with us now. And then other times we get kiddos who are, you know, two and a half years old, just got a diagnosis of autism. And, you know, we're the first people outside their parents who have, you know, uh, really worked with them. But the pairing, we can maybe send, uh, you know, like uh, a couple, li not links, but, uh, you know, PowerPoints or whatever that we do uh, on pairing. I'd have to like go through and edit them a little bit that we can post to that resource page. Sarah. Well, maybe if, if I could, maybe if um, either you or Lara could give a specific example. So, for example, my child yeah. doesn't want to participate in doing the math worksheet. How would I use the principles of ABA to do that specific example? Okay, that's slightly different from pairing, but that is a good <laughs> example. It's very, I'm assuming a very common example. So as far as I thought initially we meant like participate in an ABA program in general, but like to participate in their schoolwork, Alara, why don't you go ahead and take on that specific, very common example uh, that we <laughs> get very, all the time. <laughs> yes, so um, at this point we're gonna assume that the child doesn't like math for whatever reason it may be. So ways that ABA can help with that is if we, again, if say we're using that iPad as something to again reinforce, which is again, is to increase it happening for us. We want to increase them actually being able to do this math. 
So in ABA, we would kind of set that contingency of, hey, we're going to do this math. We're going to do, should give them choices. We want to do, do you want to do five questions or should we do four questions? And, you know, having that kid a part of what's happening, like, yeah, I don't like this, but I'm involved. So then now they're just like, well, of course, nine out of 10 times, we know where they're going to pick the four, which is fine. Hey, let's pick four questions. Four is better than zero. Um, so now with the, the kids agreeing to four, great. I was like, so what are we going to work for? That's that reinforcement. That's that contingency. First, we need to do our work and then we get something since you know it's that iPad. Cool. All right. Have that iPad close enough where it's still in your proximity, but the kid can't get to it. Your child can't like reach. I was like, but he sees it. And then ask those questions. What are we going to do on the iPad? Are we going to watch a video? Are we going to play a game? You're getting them involved. You're getting them excited to be able to be on that iPad. And you know, they're, they're your kids, so you know what gets them happy. So if that means you're a little bit goofier with them, then do that. So then when you're about to be like, all right, I'm so excited. We're going to watch this YouTube video of SpongeBob. He's so silly, you know. Okay, so we got to do four problems. And then what do we get? Have them reiterate. If Again, if they're verbal, um, have them re reiterate like, oh, yeah, four problems and then SpongeBob. You know, it's really like coming down to their level you know it's not having them come up to yours it's you coming down to them and seeing what they want to work for and it's a win-win situation so they're still getting their math done and you don't need to think that um all their work has to get done at that one moment if say they have 10 problems they need to get done do four now have you know a break can, you know, especially since you're in the home environment right now, it's already a little weird for them to have to do homework at home. They're just like school, home, two separate things. They do not mix. Like you don't make me do things here that I do at school. Um, so you're already having to deal with that environmental issues right there. And that's nothing you can do about that. It is what it is. So that's why getting them involved in what they want to do. If you know they have to do multiple subjects, again, should we do math or reading? You know, pan this out earlier. Be like, hey, we're going to do this later. Which one should we do first? Have them pick and leave it at that because you don't want to overwhelm them because they're already dealing with a lot of being in the house constantly. Only thing you can do is maybe go for a walk down the street. You can't go to the park. You can't go to like a gymboree. Like all these extra things that you used to do with them isn't there anymore. I was like, so you really want to space it out as much as you can. Um, so those are, that's, and that itself is ABA. First then, that's ABA, you know, setting those contingencies, that's ABA. You're doing these things probably more than you know it. It's just, you just don't know the correct terminology, which is perfectly fine because what you need is the actions. You don't need the words behind it. What you want is the actions behind it because what you want is the results. Um, so that's so, my opinion for it. Yeah, no, that's great. And then the the second question that we always get with that is, well, what about when you're trying to turn that iPad off and you don't mm -hmm. have another, right? So it's okay, now it's time to turn that off because we're going to go to dinner or something that's not something that they really want. How does it work in that situation? Well, for that, it's kind of like letting, just like how we let them know, like, hey, later we're going to do either math or reading, kind of letting them know that, you know, we're going to get the iPad, but how long are you going to let them get it for? Because nobody, no kid likes to be sprung on them that it's all done. As an adult, I don't like that. So why would we assume a child would like that, especially for something that they love so much? I was like, so just be like, sure, great job. You worked great. So we're going to get two minutes or five minutes and then we have to go to dinner and you need to hype up that dinner time hype up what are we having do you know we're having chicken nuggets um we're having this do you want to help set the table again these are all going to be things that need to be um functionally appropriate for your child because not all kids are going to be able to do that so if your child is i'm speaking as if it could be if your child can give them that ability to be involved. Because again, when you determine those functions, 
those functions, I was like, now you're playing into the, that attention because now when previously, when you were cooking dinner and they might've been having problems, it, that could have been an attention seeking. So now by you having them involved, those behaviors in itself can possibly reduce because you're asking them who wants to set the table? Who wants to get the silverware and the cups? And wh where's mom gonna sit? Where's your dad gonna sit? Is he gonna sit all the way at the other end of the table? Oh no, he's never gonna eat. It's about engaging them because this is what reality is right now is that we're in the home. So we have to make it as exciting as possible for them. Great, great. So we have another question. Any suggestions on how to handle the automatic behavior of chewing, and this would be for a five-year-old. Um, yeah, so that's one where we definitely have to say if they already have an ABA provider to consult with them. Um, going on past experience, so she said chewing, so I'm going to assume that does not mean also swallowing. Uh, so just like, you know, they want to chew on something, not necessarily eating or pica, um, you know, different things. A five-year-old, you know, obviously developmentally, that's, you know, five-year-olds put stuff in their mouth, but, you know, I'm assuming this is probably at a higher rate, much more significant than that. Typically, what we would probably do is try to find something like that they were, with an automatically reinforced behavior, it's hard to just make it go away. You can make it go away, but uh, it, it's not always necessarily like the best way to approach that. Lots of times we try to find what's called a replacement behavior. Something that comes to mind right away for chewing behavior, assuming that it's just the sensation of chewing. And you know, these might not be like uh, the best things, but they probably are definitely a step up from just chewing on random objects is to try and reinforce gum chewing, to try and reinforce chewing on ice, you know, gum is gum, you know what I mean? Maybe they'll swallow it right away. Maybe, you know, hold it in their mouth. Maybe it doesn't give quite as much of that sensation. Chewing on ice, you know, I don't know if a dentist would love that, um, you know what I mean? But it's probably better than chewing on, you know, toys or, you know, whatever it may or may not be. Uh, but that might give you more of that really like <laughs> sensation that they might be looking for. And that's making a lot of assumptions, you know, again, they should, uh, you know, we'd strongly encourage them to consult with their behavior analyst. And if they don't have a behavior analyst to, you know, seek one out. Uh, Lara, any other thoughts on that possibly, you know, chewing? Again, we're assuming they're not swallowing whatever so they're chewing. So we did got uh, another confirmation. So yes, she's just referring to chewing. Okay, okay. so she's just like biting stuff, not swallowing. Biting so stuff. That's, that's way better than it could be. <laughs> you know, definitely. <laughs> yeah, they do have these things called chewies. Um, what specifically made for that, where they come in different shapes and colors, and it's specifically made for a child to be able to chew on it, um, depending on economic um, issues. If that is not something that's plausible, then I definitely would go with a, you know, gum. We, I mean, we can even go even worse than that, you know, a straw. Uh, <laughs> Like it's, it's kind of just going to de depend and, and, you know, you're going to want to see like, is this happening all the time? Is it happening when maybe, you know, they have maybe a little, they're a little anxious because they know they're going to work or because it's time to go to bed or it's time for something like kind of seeing what's happening previously, which is something that we call um, antecedent, which is basically what's happening before this behavior. So which is a part of our functions again. Um, so that's, that's going to be essential too, um, but just off the whim, then yes, definitely I would get a chewy, again, um, gum, straw, anything that you know that will give them that sensation and then uh, speak with a professional because again, there are ways that we can um, reduce how much that a child chews in that nature. Yeah, and it's it's not an uncommon, you know, yeah. problem or issue, you know, to come across. And then even developmentally, I have a, a daughter, she's almost two years old. And, you know, at one point she definitely went through her, you know, because chewing phase happened. That's what, you know, developmentally that does happen. Five years old, obviously, you know, is older, um, you know, but with her, you know, she had a little unicorn thing. I don't know what it was officially called, but it was a little rubbery unicorn. 
And anytime I saw that mouth go into something that wasn't that unicorn, I made that unicorn appear, uh, you know, and, and gave her that as the alternative. Um, again, that, that is what would first come to mind is to find an alternative. Um, hopefully there would be buy-in and hopefully that would be filling that sensation. Um, but again, I would consult if you, you know, if you don't have a current behavior analyst, uh, I would seek one out. Um, and, you know, if you do, then, you know, definitely consult with them. But, you know, a, a replacement behavior is what would initially come to mind for something like that. Although, you know, there is other ways to uh, address the behavior like that. But that's our best, you know, th thought that first comes to mind. Yeah. And if anytime you see that your child, like, not chewing, give them some verbal praise, you know, you know, just be like, great job. You know, you can use your own lingo. Like, sometimes here we call it, like, um, quiet mouse, when a kid is just sitting there quiet, happy as can be, um, you know, figure out what works best for you. And like when they're, when your child's not doing that, like you're doing amazing, great job, you know? And then now you're increasing. They're just like, oh, I love how mom is saying this about me. And, you know, but, and then you're also labeling that behavior, you know, great job, not, you know, having a quiet mouth because you never want to label what you don't want to see. I was like, because that's, head that that's what they're hearing chewing chewing that's what they're going to do is chew but when you give them the correct response that you want to see then that's what they're going to process so they're going to process like huh quiet mouths quiet mouths and then praise from mom or praise from dad you know what i mean so that's how you that's another alternative again i agree you should definitely seek someone um a professional to just to ensure that that's happening but just, to, you know, there is no one, again, there's no cookie cutter, you know, one way might work, another way might not. So this is definitely just a suggestion. So try it out, see if it works. If not, you know, then get a chewy or a straw. Um, but just always remember, like, you, 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 your world is huge for trying things. Don't think just because you fail once who knows what's going to happen now, or, you know, you're defeated because that's not the case. You know, there's many things that I have failed many times with my kids and thinking that I was going to fix it and it, it didn't work and the, the behavior went up and I'm just like, no, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I was like, but it's just because remember, it, each child is different. So never be afraid to try. Another thing too, just to piggyback on that, I know we kind of went, you know, uh, big picture with that as well too, when we're talking about these behavior interventions, um, so often we want to look for that one tidbit of advice, that one strategy that like click your fingers and now all of a sudden it's not an issue anymore. Um, and I hear that a lot at different presentations uh, and sometimes that is the case, but in my experience and I feel like, you know, a lot of people who work, you know, and live with individuals with special needs in general will say that oftentimes it requires a lot of repetition and a lot of different attempts and, you know, keep, uh, you know, just to keep uh, hammering away on those interventions, like, you know, that uh, magic, you know, uh, like I said, snap of the fingers intervention. I'm not saying that they don't exist <laughs> because I won't discredit what people have said. I'm like, I'm sure that you changed that one thing and then they never had another issue ever again. Uh, I don't think that you're making that up, but I've never come across that. You know, lots of times it involves you know, sometimes some kids quicker than others, some kids with some things quicker than others, you know, sometimes behavior, you know, all, even to another thing is like, oh, you know, all of a sudden you'd be like, oh man, remember when, you know, he used to do that all the time? He hasn't done that in a long time. We didn't even notice almost, you know what I mean? Just kind of like, uh, you know, went away, we were working on it forever. But, um, you know, just to throw that out there for parents, uh, especially, you know, these things take effort. They take, lots of repetition and lots of hard work sometimes. Um, and the times that they don't, then that is even better. You know what I mean? But uh, just prepare yourself, you know, sometimes, you know, a thing like that to get a child to switch from one behavior, which is chewing again, I'm assuming on, you know, random things or, you know what I mean? Definitely things they're not supposed to be chewing on to switch that to, you know, a replacement behavior to try and make that behavior go away. Uh, will probably take uh, a lot of attempts and a lot of uh, reinforcing those other behaviors that you want to see or those alternative behaviors that you would want to see. Yeah, and to piggyback again off of that, um, I just really want to reiterate that there is no 
perfect answer for this. Sure. If there's, there, there's not one for me and regardless of to the letters I have behind my name, there is no perfect answer. So never be too hard on yourself when you're trying to come up with interventions for you. It's your child. Your child sees you. You're, you have been known as like love. This is, you know, you've done nothing but nurture and care. And then they come to us and they're kind of just like, eh, who are you? You want us to do something? Okay. Like, I guess, cause you have a toy. So the relationship that you have with your child is always different than the one that we as professionals have with them. So yes, it might be a little bit harder for as a parent to kind of um, change those behaviors while at home because they see you as this is, you know, mom, dad, grandma, aunt, uncle, and you just love me regardless. And you know, you just wanna play, play, play. And so when it comes down to like, you trying to switch things up on them, they're like, hold on, what is this? You're supposed to love me. Like, we're not supposed to be like this. So just remember, like, things are little, you know, with everything that's going on, you know, just never give up. I was like, because it's, it's going to be difficult, you know what I mean? But it's not something that's not doable. Um, so we, we have a comment, not necessarily a question, but... Um, do you have any ideas of how can families focus on what to do versus what not to do? Um, I think this is related to the chew, like for example, um, using the straw instead of you know saying uh, don't chew your shirt and you are mm -hmm. uh, commenting on the negative behavior that you don't want. Mm -hmm. So an example would be, you know, use um, like can set the eyes or the straw. So do you have any ideas on how to help focus on what to do versus what not to do? I think that's that's it's the comment. So it's not posted like a question. So. OK, yeah. And then one thing that I was going to say, I was you know, going to see if it would come up anywhere else. And, you know, what Alara was saying with different things is, um, with the, the, the example for chewing is har harder to do this, but lots of times what we tell our staff here to do and you know what we would like to do is yeah don't label the thing that they're doing that is incorrect that you know. They probably already know that to some degree we already know that to some degree it's you often want to train the alternative is what we call it. Um, you know again for that behavior it's a little bit harder, but if you did come up with a replacement like uh, you know the chew on the straw or whatever you know, then you would re reinforce that is, oh, I love how you're chewing on the straw. And if they're chewing on something that's not, you know, not the straw, provide the straw and be like, oh, here's the thing you can chew on. Don't scream, you know, don't, you know, stop chewing on that. Um, you know, things like that. Because again, we don't want to label what they're not doing correctly. We want to label what they should be doing correctly. And if they are doing something correctly already, we want to take those opportunities to label those things as well. Um, you know, with the, uh, with the chewing example, it's a little harder to do because you don't often go up to someone and say like, I love how you're not chewing on anything. You know, you want to avoid something like that. But Larry gave the example of like, oh, hey, I like how your mouth is quiet, you know, kind of a weird sounding phrase um, outside of, uh, you know, SLG or special needs world. Um, but, um, you know, just one of those things that can come up and training the alternative, like, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of different examples. We do it all the time here. Uh, like, oh, you maybe have a kid that normally runs through the halls or whatever. Hey, like, you know, and they are walking one day. Or another thing too, probably better example is a kid who's shouting out, right? You know, instead of replying to the kiddo when they're shouting out, like for a teacher in a classroom screaming the teacher's name, you know, the teacher might say something not directly to the kid, but maybe an announcement to the classroom. Hey, I'm waiting for nice, quiet, raised hands. When I see nice, quiet, raised hands, I will identify or I will call on the person who has their hand up in the air. So you're trying to train that behavior you want to see instead of turning to the kid and saying, be quiet, I'll, I'll you know, get to you when I get to you. <laughs> you know I mean, that's not going to be good for anybody. Hopefully there's not, you know, teachers or behavior technicians out there doing something like that. But, you know, if a kid is yelling out like, I need help, I need help or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you know, with their worksheet, hey, you know, when I see nice, quiet hands, you know, I will come over and help whoever has that nice, quiet, raised hand and re reinforce that thing. So train that alternative behavior, label what you want to see instead of what you don't want to see. I know I kind of like 
clumsily went through that a little bit, but hopefully, um, you know, people uh, understand what I'm saying with that. And hopefully that also addresses uh, what the, the person was commenting to. And, and consistency is going to be key. So if just be prepared that if you start something, you continue on with it. Because as soon, as soon as a kid sees that, you know, oh, she's one time it works, next time it doesn't, one time she allows me, the next time um, it doesn't, you know what I mean? They're not, it's, it's a lot harder for them to have, cons to uh, change that behavior in a sense um, long term because you yourself can follow through sometimes but you can't follow through so when you see these behaviors and you truly want to change it then you need to make sure that whatever you're choosing to do you're capable of doing it and you're okay with doing that and you're able to do it on a consistent basis when it happens so if you choose to use those straws make sure you buy packs of <laughs> straws <laughs> and you keep them on you like you're a waitress. Uh -huh. And anytime that you see those behaviors, you're just I mean, you're just throwing them out. Right here, you go. Have your kid ready for your child. You know what I mean? And yes, that does that mean you might have to pick up straws at the end of the day, and there might be a thousand of them. But it, all it's going to take is one time where your child goes and picks that straw without you having to say something, where all that hard work is worth it. So when you choose that consistency. When you choose to do something that you know you can do, you're going to see results. Not saying it's going to be the next day or it's going to be the next week, but consistency is what's really going to matter. And you got to make sure whatever you choose, you can do that. Because I feel like a lot of the times, you know, we want those behaviors to change. I was like, but it's too hard. I got kids. You know, I got a husband who is like a kid, you know, you know I got to cook and I got to clean and I got to go to work. You know, you have all these variables. So, you know, maybe gum is a lot easier than a straw. Maybe because I can't be around. Maybe I need to set up areas within the entire house. So anywhere, no matter where you're at, if you see your child, then you can give them, set yourself up for success. Good. So, you know, it's almost at the end of our time. So what I'd like to end with would be some strategies of how parents can learn more. So if you could walk through what it would be like for just a couple different scenarios. The first one would be a parent who doesn't think their child would do well virtually doing ABA. What could that look like for a family um, who would like to explore doing some ABA? You wanna do go for it, Alara, since you're doing <laughs> this right now? <laughs> um, my thing is, is, ABA doesn't say my child. ABA doesn't mean my child needs to sit there. Like every, all the strategies that we're talking about, parents are the ones that are implementing them. The child isn't sitting down and learning about chewies and straws and gum to use. It's the parent. So definitely my suggestion would be you, um, you know, before you go to bed, give yourself that time to do that research, to look up um, using Connecting for Kids, Milestone, things of that nature, um, in order to find, there's so many platforms out there that parents are just talking about, like, my kid, this is what's happening with my kid, you know, you, you need to be involved with it as much as possible in order to see that difference. And so, can a parent, um, work with a therapist virtually? So oh, definitely, definitely. I currently do that um, now with uh, multiple parents through telehealth. And it's, I kind of give them an idea like, okay, so we're trying to teach your, your child how colors using a communication device, not a problem. Where is the device? Where is it seated for him? Is it on the, on the screen that it needs to be? Great. Again, you, as a parent, you're setting your child up for success. You've already started ABA right there and you don't even know it so then I'm kind of like okay so these are the colors we're going to do um and I teach the parents this is what you say say what color um we call those SDs or discriminative stimuluses it's kind of just saying you know what I need from you I'm just putting it out there you know what I mean and so I teach the parent like this is how you say it because this is the response that you want to have and um, and as a provider I'm there to be a part of it with you so as your kid might be making mistakes, I'd be like, okay, so hold on, you know, physically show him where the correct response is. 
give him that ability to see what what's what's what you want and then let him try and then he got, gets it right great job i need you to praise him now it's definitely a collaboration um within the telehealth which is definitely something that we do here especially um at SLG at our Westlake location is that we work close with our parents and sometimes we might work with the kids one-on-one -on -one, um but I definitely have parents there as much as possible see what I'm doing see the techniques that I'm using so when I'm not around you can do the same thing so the hour that they may have with me you might give them another 30 minutes so they're getting another 30 minutes a day imagine how far we can advance them or get them at least to where they are now um, with everything happening since they haven't been in school for so long, um, where the level that they can be at by us working together, both me directly, you indirectly, you learning techniques, you letting me know. It's a big, like, yes, definitely, yes. Great. And then the last thing I just wanted to end with, I know that the trainings are on hold for right now, but would you mind just talking a little bit about the trainings that you normally put on? Because they're free for parents. Um, even parents who aren't part of your, your center. So how would a parent just well, describe what those trainings are and how a parent would be able to um, learn more about them and what you'll be offering um, either after the COVID or during this crisis? Sure, we offer um, what we call parent and community trainings. Uh, like you said, they're open to the public. They're open to you know families of current individuals who get our services. They're open to uh, paraprofessionals from school districts, teachers, whoever, you know, wants to come. Um, and we do a different topic every month. And we have like the predetermined list, like, you know, throughout the year, the list comes out in July, probably, and they go August till June. So they run through the school year. Um, and every month, like I said, we do a different topic. And they are all, um, you know, ABA uh, concepts, uh, to some degree, like some of them more so than others but we try to make them in uh, parent friendly language because I, I do think that that sometimes, and you know, tonight even a couple of times probably tripped me up a little bit is bridging the gap between that lingo that we use, you know, in our terminology and then, you know, practical application for it, uh, which is, you know, what we're all about, but it can sometimes be tough to break the, uh, the language mold there, you know, and get out of our terms and be like, Anna, see, you no, know, the thing that's happening before this app, bad thing happened, you know, you wanna see. Um, and so they are, you know, definitely more parent friendly language. We do uh, different ones like, you know, the one that comes up in usually November or December is, you know, making the holidays happy. And it's just like different interventions you can use to talk about different schedules you can set up and different things you can try to apply with your, um, you know, the individual that you're trying to apply them with. We have tolerating no, um, you know, I think there's a topic on, um, you know, different uh, sexuality and things like that as well uh, that we do. And we rotate them a little bit, you know, they're usually, you know, some that we always do every year and then others we have been trying to rotate them in and out a little bit and coming up with new topics. But yeah, they're free and open to the public. And one thing that we're kind of exploring right now as a company due to the coronavirus, so it might be a, uh, you know, helpful, you know, thing that to come out of all of this, uh, you know, misery, I guess is the best way to describe it or inconvenience for some, but way worse for others, is that we might be taking those virtual because they've always been in person. We have four different locations in the state, uh, Columbus, Mansfield, St. Clairsville, and Westlake is our Cleveland office. Um, and they've always been in person and we've tried different times. Like we've tried from three till five, we've tried from, you know, five till seven, you know, when can people get here? Um, and sometimes they're very well attended and other times we don't get anybody at all. Um, and so the times and the day of the week and things like that have been a little difficult, but we'll probably explore taking those virtual and that will probably help people, you know, then you don't have to worry as much about childcare. You don't have to worry about, you know, staying in your, uh, you know, professional clothes, going straight from work and things like that. You can do it in your sweatpants with a glass of wine, listen to us tell you uh, all about accepting no and, you know, how to make the holidays happier and things like that. Um, so that is something that we offer and we will continue to offer it. Uh, we put it posted up on our Facebook page and, you know, I know Connecting for Kids has uh, always shared them when we've sent the list and things like that, which we definitely appreciate. Um, and so we will definitely, once we figure out what we're doing with that for the upcoming 2020, 2021 school year, uh, we will get that list out. And yeah, like we said, anyone is more than welcome to attend. 
um, to hopefully get uh, knowledge that we can provide to, you know, um, better the lives of individuals with disabilities. And they typically occur like the last Monday of the month. Um, so now I'd, again, I don't know if that's going to change or not, but typically that is when it um, occurred because, you know, I, I'm the one who runs it. You'll see me <laughs> <laughs> doing the topics. Um, but typically we try to like pick one day a month and stay consistent with that just so we can kind of get in routine for the parents just to make it a little easier so they know like every day this month, this is when this happens. Good. And then Sarah, did we get to all the questions? Is there still people watching? No, I think that was it, right, Andrea? Yeah, I Andrea? think we got all the questions covered. Yeah. All so the questions, you. awesome. Do you mind, Sarah, if I uh, just go over like a couple of the resources real quick? No, please that, do. That we're gonna offer. All right, so a couple things, you know, and, and again, trying to like make this parent focused as well as ABA focused. Um, one book that I want to recommend that I have with me right here, you can find it on Amazon, it is ABA, it's like backwards the way I'm reading right now, ABA, uh, the ABA Visual Language Applied Behavior Analysis. It is very user friendly. There's pictures for almost every term, uh, very understandable examples. And it seems to be fairly reliable. Sometimes when you buy these books, all of a sudden you come across an example, you're like, oh, that's not what that means. Uh, but this one, I haven't noticed anything, and I know that other, um, you know, people that we work with and different BCBAs have, you know, also said that that is a, a good book, and it's very reader friendly. Is is my whole point. Uh, so it's ABA, the visual, ABA visual language. It's all you know, picture based with that term attached to it, and it is on Amazon. I just looked it up. I bought it a couple years ago. It was only like ten dollars. I looked it up yesterday. It's thirty now. So. Definitely a little bit more pricey than it once was, um, but still, like, if you are serious about, um, you know, trying to, you know, if you're passionate about ABA, whether you want to make it your career or whether you have a child that you think that it is very effective for, uh, I think that that book would be uh, very reader friendly and worth your while to pick up. And then another one, we are going to attach the link to it is, um, and I wish I would have maybe maybe focused this uh, presentation a little bit more on it, is the seven steps to successful parenting. It's like a PDF. Uh, we'll give the link for it. It's by Robert Schramm, who is a BCBA. Um, it is full of a lot of good information. It's, uh, there's another one that he did, the seven steps uh, to instructional control. They're all very similar. And, and it goes over the different concepts like pairing that I was discussing earlier and things like that, uh, that I think parents, again, you know, if you're committed to ABA and you think the ABA is the best, uh, you know, therapy for your child and you're really invested in it and want to know more about what you can do at home, I would recommend those two uh, different resources. And again, you know, like we've said a few times, if you currently have a BCBA uh, that you're working with, reach out to them and ask them these same questions. And if you don't have one, uh, seek one out and, you know, just keep asking until you're able to get them as a resource. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We'll make sure that we include those in the links as well as we'll send an email out to everybody who pre-registered with that information. I can't tell you how grateful we are that you um, shared your insight with our families tonight and shared um, some of these techniques. Um, it's Ken and Alera from the Silver Lining Group. You guys called it TSG a couple times, I think, right? SLG. SLG. Yeah. SLG. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so now I know the acronym. Well, good. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to thank Nords Incorporation Foundation for sponsoring this. Um, and thank you, Andrea, for helping to field the questions from the families. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.